The Rigel Black Chronicles, Book One, The Pure Blood Pretense. Chapter 13. He was drowning in stupidity. An artery of red ink bled without mercy from his quill, the only sane response to such criminally misinformed notions of magic. What little substance he found buried in the syntactic terrorism that passed for teenage literacy was enough to make him pity the great scholars of old, whose writings should have survived to be misquoted and petulantly interrogated by the likes of Zacharias Smith. Vitriol was the only defence. He must expunge any sense of certainty from their inflated psyches, so sufficient doubt to reap a pause long enough for an inkling of common sense to trickle into their thick, sociopathic little... Well now, here we are again. Albus's cheerful injection hauled him from the ocean of idiocy, but it took Severus a moment to shake off his despairing wrath. He never questioned his choice of profession more than when he was twenty essays deep, not a coherent example of actual comprehension in sight. The staff room had cleared out, save for Pomona, Minerva and Phileas, and the headmaster had joined them. Ah, uh, it would be the third Friday then. In the third week of September, Albus met with his heads of house to informally discuss the emergent issues of the new term. It was not, as Sinistra was so fond of intimating, an excuse for the five of them to gossip about their students. Rather, it was a chance to socialise individual problems before they became everyone's. Albus twinkled fondly at them, a curator admiring his own collection of the greatest minds in the modern magical community. Not for the first time, Severus wondered at his own inclusion. No matter the articles he wrote nor the inroads he made, he could never shrug off the wretched boy in two thin clothes who'd stumbled into the great hall without the wherewithal to even dream of a life outside of misery and insignificance. The headmaster rocked in a chair by the fire, stroking his beard with a self-satisfied smile. Before we begin, I'd like to thank each of you for another seamless start to the school year. His startling blue eyes landed on Severus. Hogwarts would be nothing without you. Severus looked away. The old wizard was far too perceptive for anyone's sensibility. Albus continued blithely, as if he wasn't dropping each word with studied precision into Severus's roiling pool of self-doubt. Thank you also for appearing so promptly for this meeting. I know well the value of your time and talents. Some of us appear more willingly than others. Phileas tipped his head at Severus from a plush velvet footstool. Be honest, you forgot it was today. Severus lifted a cold cup of tea, only a sardonic twist at the edge of his mouth, acknowledging the accuracy of the remark. Pomona leaned sideways on the sofa to murmur conspiratorially to Minerva. He does that so well. Minerva pursed her lips to hide a smile of agreement. She and Severus had a friendship that only worked because neither of them admitted to it. Too well. How many of my cubs have you traumatized this month, Severus? No more than deserved it, as always. Now, Severus. Albus crooked a finger, and one of the enormous blankets Hagrid was always knitting leapt onto his legs like a lapdog. We know how you value a controlled work environment. Potions is an exceedingly dangerous and, in the presence of adolescence, unpredictable art. And none of us would dream of telling you how to run your classroom. I sincerely doubt any of you could stomach the number of near maimings I avert daily. But was it truly necessary to tell the third-year Ravenclaws that you would personally ensure they failed their OWLs in two years if they didn't produce a satisfactory weakening solution by the end of the period? Albus gazed mildly at the ceiling. I'm told Poppy ran completely out of calming draughts that afternoon as I am the one responsible for replacing those calming drafts, I see no reason for anyone else to complain. Severus finished his tea unconcernedly. 
Incidentally, every one of those approval-seeking balls of anxiety produced satisfactory results, so I conclude my methods are effective. Leaving the subject of your methods for the next generation of mind healers to unravel, there are a couple of students I think we should discuss. Pomona looked around for support. Minerva nodded sharply. Who are you concerned about? What do you think of Neville Longbottom? I found him somewhat timid in my classes, for all that he seems to be well-versed in my subject. His parents were both so outgoing, Phileas recalled. Severus supposed that was one description for the way Frank and Alice vied for the Interhouse Popularity Award before finally combining their fan clubs in the great Frallis Union of 75. Do we have any reason to believe his home life is unpleasant? Frank and Alice abuse a child? Minerva huffed. Never. The grandmother, though. Pomona cast an apologetic glance at Albus. Albus considered the implication. As much as I admire Augusta, it is fair to say she has an overbearing way with children. She still resides at Longbottom Manor with her son, and I cannot imagine her forgoing the opportunity to mould her grandson. Are you concerned, Minerva? The head of Gryffindor House made a dismissive motion. He is making friends, the youngest Weasley boy for one. I will keep an eye out, but I suspect Hogwarts will give him the space he needs to flourish in his own time. Pomona deferred, as ever, to Minerva. Then let us turn to Marcus Flint. There is something changed about his attitude this year. After being forced to repeat fifth year and denied his OWLs, I expected more resistance, but his work has been on time and completely up to snuff. She shook her head in evident bewilderment. I was going to mention Mr. Flint as well, Minerva said grimly. His work is completed, but it doesn't read at all like him. Even his written tests and quizzes have changed tone. He used to write with studied boredom and badly concealed indignation at the very idea that he be asked to prove what he knows. Now, his in-class work is utterly neutral, and his essays are peppered with conjecture and suggestions for theoretical applications. He sounds captivated by the material. I cannot tell if he has found a new, more subtle way to mock the assignment, or if he finds it amusing to completely subvert my expectations of him. Perhaps he has learned his lesson and is turning over a new leaf, Phileas suggested. Severus had not thought it possible to reach such an age with a full supply of naive optimism. What he's learned is that assignments have to get turned in for him to pass. They didn't honestly think he was writing them, did they? The handwriting charms are convincing, and I've no doubt he changed the tone of his classroom assignments to lessen suspicion. But make no mistake, he has arranged for someone else to complete them. Pomona looked scandalized, but Minerva only nodded. She must have suspected as well. Severus had known from the first essay, extensively cited, dizzyingly theoretical and creative. If Marcus Flint had written it, he'd eat his stirring rod. Severus had combed his copies of previous essays by the older Ravenclaws, but the style hadn't fit anyone in particular. What will you do? Minerva demanded. Severus lifted an eyebrow. Without proof, I cannot do a thing. I suspect Flint knows this. Unless the other student comes forward, our only evidence is stylistic. As long as he passes every test which he is more than capable of, it will be impossible to prove he isn't doing the assignments. Minerva frowned, dissatisfied. We will watch the older students for signs of inexplicable stress or fatigue. Someone at this school is carrying a double workload. It would be impossible for a newt student to sustain that for long, Pomona supposed. Could it be a younger student? Phileas asked. Now that I consider it, there was an unstudied tone of curiosity in some of Flint's essays this term. It would fit with a student who hadn't covered the topic in a previous year. I doubt they're any younger than fourth year, Minerva said. She sounded confident. Much can be gleaned from books, but Flint turned in an exceptionally complicated essay on vanishing theory. It demonstrated a firm grasp on non-being and the logical consequences of an object retaining properties after vanishment. None of my third years are so advanced. Albus leaned forward as though he were going to impart something weighty and wise. 
but then he leaned back again, and his incessant rocking resumed. Continue to mark Mr. Flint's assignments as you would any other. I trust you to keep an eye on the situation, Severus. I keep both eyes on my Slytherins without your prompting, Severus assured him. Then I hope you'll be having a word with young Mr. Black as well, Minerva put in. Severus gave her a narrow-eyed look. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, Minerva. The older witch gave him an incredulous look back. You do not find him taciturn and impossible to teach, he scowled. I find him engaged and hard-working. His written assignments show a rare rigour of thought and his practical work is flawless. Albus twinkled at him from his rocking chair and Severus was sorely tempted to transfigure it into a wooden pony. The past does not cloud my eyes so much that I cannot see when potential lies undisguised before me. He snapped. The boy is a once-in-a-decade talent. It sounds as though we are acquainted with two very different Mr. Blacks, Minerva said. I admit his written work is good. In fact, his comprehension of the theory is the only thing scraping him a passing mark. As to his practical work, it is non-existent. I have yet to witness him perform a single piece of transfiguration, though he at least pretended to succeed rather quickly in the first lesson. Severus was not the only one frowning now. I've not had any trouble, Pomona said. Black is a veritable fountain of knowledge when it comes to plants, particularly the ones used in potions. She nodded in acknowledgement to Severus. And he certainly doesn't balk at practical assignments. An unusual discrepancy. Phileas looked more interested than disappointed at the idea. I have to agree with Minerva. I give him as much credit as I can for his written work, and he can demonstrate the incantations and the wand movements that are expected, but he never actually casts the charm. He refuses to, Albus clarified. No. Minerva gave a frustrated scowl, and Severus saw how much it irked her, having Sirius Black's heir prove lacklustre in her subject. He appears to try, at least the first few times, but it's as if... Well... The boy cannot be a squib, Severus snapped. People would know, Phileas agreed, and I doubt his family would have let him attend school. Severus sneered. Light-aligned or no, all pure bloods held the same prejudice when it came to magical ability. The idea that Sirius Black would send his son to face harassment and discrimination when he could quietly homeschool him instead was ridiculous. The day Longbottom fell off his broom? Pomona's slow words coaxed only impatient confusion from the rest of them. She hurried to explain— Rolanda said his motion was inexplicably arrested before he hit the ground. She believed it to be accidental magic, but she also said that young Malfoy claimed it was Black who stopped the boy's fall. Phileas raised his eyebrows. As far as I've seen, he has never even made his feather twitch. Another puzzle, Albus remarked, absently braiding a section of his beard. A young wizard has the understanding, diligence and potential to perform magic, and yet he doesn't. One account credits him with powerful, albeit likely uncontrolled, magical ability. No other signs of trauma have presented to suggest a natural block on his magic. He has friends, no behavioural issues. Anything to add, Severus? He kept the defensive anger from his expression as he answered. I had not realised there was a problem. I will schedule a conference with Mr Black this week to assess the situation. It will not continue. Keep us abreast of your decisions, Albus turned back to Minerva. What else? The prefects have signed a petition to increase the number of Hogsmeade weekends around the holidays. Whatever else they spoke of, Severus did not hear it. He was busy replaying his every interaction with Black. Had he seen him do magic? Any at all? Potions did not require it at the first year level, but surely he would have noticed something. Draco lit the other boy's fire once or twice, it was true, and he had seen Miss Parkinson casting an eye protection charm on her friend. But was that proof? He couldn't credence it, for all that he'd long anticipated the Black's insanity-cultivating inbreeding coming home to roost in his old nemesis's line, did it have to be this boy who might actually make something of himself one day? 
Some other explanation was at play. The boy hadn't been shy about his obsession with potions. Perhaps Severus had underestimated how dismissive he would be of the other subjects by comparison. If the boy needed motivation, Severus would simply provide it. The end of September swept her up in a whirlwind that threatened to toss her straight into October. She thought she had settled into the rhythm of classes and studying, but at some silent signal, the tempo double-timed. Balancing her and Flint's assignments was hard enough without the teachers uniting in displeasure at her inability to muster a spell. They heaped extra practice assignments in her lap and pushed her harder than ever in class until she began to dread every wand lesson in their schedule. She hated to face their inevitable disappointment, not to mention the sidelong looks from her classmates. Neither were particularly subtle. What was she supposed to do? The magic didn't come to her. Was that such a crime? The only relief came with decreased scrutiny from Pansy and Draco, whose schedules ramped up in time with her own. Pansy filled her spare hours with strategic socialization, while Draco was reaping the rewards of ambition in the worst way. We have practice every other evening, he bemoaned Thursday morning. There was a defensive note in his voice that leaned embarrassed, probably because Pansy had only narrowly rescued him from a faceplant in the morning porridge. The blonde boy rubbed his eyes irritably. It's like Flint doesn't have anything better to do than play Quidditch, never mind that we mere humans can barely keep up with our classes with this schedule. Doesn't the captain care about his own marks? Pansy asked. That's what's wild. His marks are fine. Draco shook his head. I heard the others say he must have a time-turner or something. Rigel tried not to look guilty. At least you'll be a shoe-in for the House Cup. None of the other teams are practising so hard, are they? I think Wood tried to endorse a similar schedule, but his team revolted. Draco pushed his plate away to make room for his elbows. Propping his head on his hands, he seemed to be considering inciting a rebellion of his own. Perhaps when you win the first match, he'll back off, Pansy suggested. If any of us survive that long... Draco's head dipped dangerously toward his pumpkin juice. You won't survive by not eating, Pansy nudged his plate back toward him. Finish up so we can get to potions. Yes, Mum, Draco grumbled. On their way to the dungeons, the potions master overtook them. Mr. Black, see me in my office after afternoon classes? Yes, sir, Rigel said automatically. Then his words caught up with her. After classes, to discuss one of her assignments, or could he be ready to give her extra lessons? She searched Snape's face, but found no clues in his customary scowl. After a weighty look she wasn't sure how to interpret, Snape strode past them in a long, practised stride. "'What do you think he wants?' Pansy asked quietly. Rigel shrugged, trying not to get her hopes up. "'Maybe he has another assignment for me.' "'He just gave you that essay on ingredients from magical beings,' Draco pointed out. "'And he doesn't need you to come to his office to give you an assignment. "'And he's waiting till after our other classes.' That means he thinks it'll take a while. Which could mean anything. Rigel tried not to worry. I'll find out this afternoon. Pansy's eyes were curious, but she smoothed her face into a polished mask as they reached the potions classroom. Let us know how it goes. Of course. If Rigel thought a summoning to Snape's office would be less nerve-wracking the second time around, she was forced to re-evaluate that assumption as she stood before the door, steeling herself to grasp the silver handle and turn it. Snape's voice called impatiently from within before she got the chance, and she felt her cheeks warm. He must have proximity spells to alert him to loitering students. Rigel entered sheepishly and saw, to her surprise, that Snape had already provided her a chair this time. She sat uncertainly, still without a guess as to whether she was in trouble or not. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you here, so I will not waste your time with pleasantries, Snape began, folding his hands before him on the desk. Rigel nodded, though her affirmation hadn't been sought. 
It is my duty, as both a professor and a head of house, to pay close attention to the students in my care. And when there appear to be discrepancies in a student's work, it does not fail to come to my notice. His voice was just loud enough to fill the small room without echoing, but it could not be called soft. It was deadly. Rigel's face blanched. She tore her eyes from Snape's to conduct a detailed study of her knees, even as her mind took panicked flight and landed on the roll of corrected essays in her book bag. Flint's essay on potion fusion, from the same assignment she'd helped Percy with, in red ink where the final mark should be, were the words transparently done. Make no mistake, the source of your newfound interest in schoolwork will soon be exposed. At the time, she'd written it off as an attempt to frighten Flint into coming clean. It was too much to hope that none of the professors would notice Flint's work changing so drastically, but as long as no one pointed the finger at her, it was Flint's lookout. And how could anyone suspect her? She'd taken extra care with the potion's essays because she knew she had a tendency to get carried away in that subject. In Flint's essays, she used certain words and phrases repeatedly, then took pains to never use those identifiers in her own papers. But what if she hadn't been careful enough? If he knew... I see you understand my meaning, Snape drawled. Too late, Rigel realised, looking down ashamedly was as good as admitting her guilt. She raised her eyes slowly, widening them to a believable level of innocence as she did, until they rested steadily and blankly at the level of Snape's forehead. A disappointed frown settled into his brow, and it was nothing like the other professor's frustration. They could berate her, but in the end she didn't care what they thought of her. The same could not be said of the potions master. Your work in my subject exceeds my usual standards, which only contributes to the distasteful nature of this situation. Were it merely a potions issue, we could work it out discreetly, but the transfiguration, charms and defence professors have all brought their concerns to light. And as your head of house, it falls to me to deal with it. Rigel shook with the effort of holding back tears. She willed herself not to crumple, but her face felt hot and her eyes stung as she forced them to remain open, unblinking. How could she have erred so grievously that all those professors connected her to Flint's essays? She'd been so careful, hadn't she? Rigel tried to focus on Snape's words, but it was hard with her breath so loud in her chest. I have not handled a student with problems of this exact nature before, he admitted. Rigel willed her throat to swallow. Was what she'd done really so bad? Worse than anything he'd seen in years of teaching? No one has a word of reproach for your written work, but in every class requiring practical demonstration of wand magic, you fail to produce. Professor Flitwick believes you are genuinely trying, while Professor McGonagall is convinced you do not wish to succeed. Care to explain how it is you've yet to cast a single spell in the month since your arrival? Oh, Rigel thought, all the wind going out of her fear. Right. She should have known that would get back to her head of house at some point. She just hadn't expected him to take it so seriously. For a moment, she'd thought she was being expelled. I'm here to learn potions, she said, shrugging her shoulders. It was easier to pretend not to care, to act as though her daily failure didn't bother her much at all. That does not give you leave to disregard everything else, you foolish child. Rigel shrank back from his ire, not understanding its vehemence. Certainly it was inconvenient for the other professors to be bothering him over her poor wand work, but it wasn't as though she'd intended for it to come back on him. I haven't been, she protested, even clear of the fear that he'd discovered her deal with Flint and all it entailed. Rigel still felt off balance. I do the assignments. I study for the quizzes. And your practical performance on these quizzes... Snape's nostrils flared. What do you say about that? Rigel dropped her eyes. I try, I swear I'm trying. The wand stuff just doesn't work for me. It's so easy for everyone else. And I know McGonagall thinks I'm not trying at all, but I don't know what else to do. I've done every assignment. And then some. Snape let out a sigh that had Rigel raising her gaze again, hopefully. 
You must understand that this cannot continue the way it has been. Why not? She didn't realize she'd said the words aloud until he snapped. Because this is a school for magic. You have to actually do magic at some point. What if I'm a squib? She knew no other word for it, this stuntedness inside her that caged whatever it was that she was supposed to be able to do as a witch. Can I still be a potions master? Snape shook his head slowly, and the world fell out from under her. Active magic is required for advanced brewing. Before the terror of his words could swallow her whole, he said carefully, I do not believe you to be a squib. I, I know there's magic inside me. I felt it. Sometimes I, or my wand, something happens. You've had bouts of accidental magic. Yes, strong ones, he pressed. That was one way to put it. Yes, strong ones. Then you aren't a squib. Snape said it so simply, so resolutely, there could be no argument. But then, what's wrong with me? Rigel searched his gaze for pity, for a sign that there was something incurably the matter with her. Snape only looked perplexed. And are you sure I have to fix it? There are many kinds of magic that do not require the use of a wand to master, he said carefully, though his white knuckles belied his calm tone of voice. But no wizard can afford to ignore one part of his power entirely. It is folly, not in the least, because it is vital for the development of your magical core that you exercise your magic consciously at this age. Quite apart from that, barring medical incapability, it is an embarrassment of a wizard who cannot manage basic spell work. I will not have an embarrassment credited to the House of Slytherin, do you understand? Yes, sir. Rigel didn't argue though it seemed an impossible demand. She tried to summon determination, but she felt she had already been defeated. Something in her expression made Snape extend his hand across the desk. Her eyes wide, she began to reach for it. He snorted, your wand, Mr. Black. Her ears burned. She dove into her bag and searched until she found it crumpling the pages of her transfiguration text at the bottom. Snape seemed to be holding back a comment. Rigel made a face. It doesn't work anyway, so I don't carry it on me. His eyes sharpened. He turned her wand over in his hands, probing for abnormalities or fissures, perhaps. Ash? Yes, twelve inches. Unicorn hair. You received it at Ollivander's. She nodded. What magic did it manifest? Rigel gazed blankly at him. What happened when you first held it? He clarified. She thought back. It got sort of warm. Snape raised an eyebrow. And Ollivander let you buy it? Rigel shrugged. He didn't have many left to offer me at that point. I went through most of his stock, trying to find one that didn't explode things violently when I touched it. This one didn't explode anything. He said it was well balanced. In truth, he'd said a bit more than that. And he hadn't been very happy with her. But she wasn't paying attention at the time. She'd pre-ordered a sample of ingredients from India and was anxious to pick them up at the apothecary. Balanced it may be, but it evidently doesn't suit you, Snape said. She couldn't tell if he was exasperated with the world in general or her in particular. Better this than a wand that explodes everything, Rigel said a bit defensively. Not being an active danger to your health is not the standard for wands, Snape drawled. If you cannot do magic with it, it might as well be a stick you found on the ground outside. We don't know it's the wand, she reminded him, giving voice once more to her fear. Maybe I can't do wand magic. Maybe I was meant to do potions and nothing else. Snape set her wand back on the desk with ill grace. There is no inherent difference between the magic that imbues a potion and the magic that turns a teacup into a rabbit. Only the manner of channeling is different. And if you cannot channel with a tool as simple as a wand, then you will certainly never master the potions that require more advanced methods of imbuing. But what can I do? Rigel interrupted. She didn't recall getting to her feet, but suddenly she was glaring down at Snape with her fear all bundled up with despair in her heart. I've tried. I'm telling you, I've said those spells again and again and nothing happens. Rigel was shaking, frustrated beyond her capacity to contain.
All month people had been pushing her, her professors, her housemates, her friends, as if being told over and over how stupid she was would somehow help. I know I'm a failure as a wizard, she said quietly. The anger cut an unfamiliar trail through her mind. She never shouted. What was she doing? But I can't just leave. My future is here at Hogwarts. Potions is all I have. And if you can't teach me because of something that I can't control, then all my hard work was wasted. And it will prove them right, a voice in her head hissed. Every day she walked the halls, hearing the footsteps of the hundreds of students that should have been there beside her. For every half-blood and muggle-born who would never see the Great Hall's sky, she had to make it work. If I fail, it vindicates everyone who thinks that half-bloods can't keep up with real wizards. She had to stay at Hogwarts, for all the kids who didn't get the chance, who didn't have a pure-blood cousin as generous as Archie, who would be forever scorned and legally exiled from their own country for a thing they couldn't change. Right. Harry had to stand up for everyone who couldn't take a stand themselves. And on top of all that, it was for their dream, hers and Archie's. And she'd be damned if something as paltry as a piece of wood stood in her way. Her temper running hot, she snatched her wand off the desk and whipped it toward the shelf of glass jars. It was like pushing a spit wad through a straw. The magic didn't want to move, but she forced it. The jars catapulted off the shelf, crashing against the stone ceiling and shattering in a shower of glass and embalming fluid. Rigel didn't even care. She laughed. How was that for a levitation charm? See? She yelled into Snape's shocked face without really seeing it. See? I can do the stupid spells. I can do them all! The wand movement came automatically, its pattern almost an afterthought, and she spat another wad of magic at the wooden chair. It exploded into a waterfall of lethally sharp needles. She exhaled, and the shield charm bloomed between her and the flying needles as easy as breathing. If she were a dragon, and she breathed fire, that is, the sound of the needles coming down was like rain hitting a metal roof, only the rain was the metal. The shield charm flickered out, and she stared at the wreckage she'd made of Snape's office. She felt numb, and she didn't notice her wand was on fire until Snape plucked it carefully from her hand. The ash wand was on fire. There was something funny about that. She just couldn't think what. Rigel swayed, and Snape reversed the transfiguration before she could collapse in a puddle of needles. She caught herself on the newly restored chair, and sank into it slowly. I... that was not well done, sir. Her voice was faint, or perhaps her hearing had gone wonky. I'm sorry. She was almost too ashamed to look Snape in the face. Almost, Rigel met his gaze with a kind of distant horror. It all felt as though it was happening to someone else, not her, some other person who had completely lost control and destroyed their head of house's office. Well... Snape had found his tongue at last, and Rigel steeled herself for a verbal lashing. I would ask to see the Lumos charm, but I've no doubt you would blind us both. Rigel's brain didn't process the words at first, and then, Sir? She gaped at his relaxed posture and half-lidded eyes. His eyebrows lifted sardonically, and there was something darkly amused about the way he held his mouth. I think it's safe to say Ollivander was vastly mistaken in allowing you to settle for an inferior fit. This wand it no less destructive than the others. He methodically set the room to rights. The glass vanished, the liquid dried up, and a freshening charm took the edge off the smell of embalming fluid. It simply required a monumental effort of will to push your magic into manifesting, though it. Snape set the singed ash wand on the desk before her, but Rigel deliberately rolled it out of her reach. That demonstration, while lacking the emotional restraint befitting a student of Salazar Slytherin, was nevertheless informative, Snape said, rolling her wand very pointedly back toward her. I imagine your incidents of accidental magic were rare as a child, rare and rather powerful. Rigel shuddered. It only happened when I was so upset I couldn't stand it. My magic would 
explode things, tear them, turn them inside out. Sometimes it vanished things completely and we never found them again. There hadn't been many incidents, but each was a terrifying monument in her memory of childhood, flash fried into her brain so she could never forget the helplessly exhilarating feeling. Eventually she'd learned not to get so upset by things. If she never got too excited or disappointed, if she didn't let anything that happened make her angry, her magic wouldn't take over. How embarrassing to have such a thing happen in front of her head of house. She was much too old for accidental magic now. Mr. Black, are you afraid of magic? She blinked in surprise. Of course not. Why would I come to a magical school if I was? Allow me to rephrase that, he said, his voice gentle. She wished he would shout at her. Are you frightened by your own magic? Rigel opened her mouth to deny it, but stopped. Was she? It galled her to admit to being afraid of something so silly. It was like being afraid of your own liver. Still, the denial would not leave her lips. The feeling that rushed up from that pit of anger both disgusted and delighted her, and then she hated herself for enjoying something so destructive. Maybe fear was too simple a word. Revulsion felt closer to the truth. You think I'm preventing myself from using magic? She could see it on his face, not pity or contempt, but the look you would give a child trying to put a square block in a round hole. It is the probable explanation, Snape said evenly. But then, don't I have reason to? She gestured to the empty shelves, the only evidence of her utter loss of composure. My magic is completely destructive. He regarded her seriously. Magic is not inherently violent or mellow. It is we that give it shape and force. Then I'm making it dangerous. Rigel let the truth settle into her, uncomfortable and cold. It's my fault, not the wand or the magic. There is something wrong with me. There is nothing wrong with you. Snape had both hands on the desk, his hair hanging into his face, dark eyes arresting in their surety. But how could he be so sure? It happens sometimes that the first bout of accidental magic, which often occurs too young to recall, startles a wizard in some way that makes them reluctant to repeat the feat. Snape spoke slowly, as though to ensure she understood. In some ways... Magic is like a muscle, but in other ways it is like water behind a dam. If you suppress your emotions in order to suppress your magic, it will only build until a day like today when it bursts free all at once. Of course it takes a negative shape. The hardest emotions to control are fear and anger. Her eyes widened with dismay. All this time I've been trying to control myself was making it worse. And every time it burst out of her, uncontrolled, it frightened her more. A self-fulfilling cycle. What about my wand? If you had sufficient control over your magic by the time you entered Ollivander's shop, it would have been difficult for the wand maker to read you. Usually he can use a person's aura to divine which wand will suit them, but you would be a dark room to his abilities. So he had me randomly try wands and hope that one fit. Snape considered the ash wand on the desk between them. The wand you ended up with was probably the least conductive of those you tried. It didn't cause anything to explode, but it prevented you from using magic, even when you consciously tried to, unless the force of your will flooded the wand and overrode its buffering qualities. I see. She didn't, really. What did it all mean? She wasn't a squib, apparently, but what now? She tried to assemble the pieces of her psyche into something resembling a rational young adult. Do I have to get a new wand? I will see the headmaster about obtaining a waiver for someone to come and collect you this Saturday, Snape said shortly. Couldn't you do it, sir? She blurted. New panic coursed through her hollowed-out veins at the thought of Sirius coming to get her. Her, not Archie, from Hogwarts. I mean, wouldn't it be better if someone from the school took me so it doesn't look like I'm getting special treatment? I cannot just leave the school to... Please, sir, you already understand the situation. She didn't care that she was imposing. Sirius could not come and collect her. It shouldn't take long since I've already tried most of the wands Mr. Ollivander has, and also, I don't think I'm ready to talk to my dad about this yet.
He wouldn't understand. That was a thing kids said about their parents, wasn't it? Anyway, he wouldn't understand. Archie's incidents of accidental magic had been textbook, adorable and benign. Snape kept silent for a long, brooding minute before he said rather tiredly, I will speak to the headmaster about this, but either way you will be acquiring a new wand. You can keep that one, Rigel said quickly. Snape shook his head. You will return it to Ollivander on Saturday. Thank you, sir. It is no more than the duties of my position demand. You shall have a working wand, lest Salazar Slytherin roll in his grave. Rigel smiled gratefully all the same. Snape had figured out what was wrong with her magic. What's more, he actually had a plan to fix it. It was indisputably more than she'd arrived with, and she wasn't even going to be expelled for doing Flint's homework. Snape checked the time with a wave of his wand. It is late, and this meeting has been more taxing than either of us anticipated. I will appraise your other professors of the situation. You will not be required to do any wand work until Monday. You may go now, if there is nothing else. Rigel rose and was almost to the door before she turned back around. I really am sorry for making a mess of your office, sir, especially about the preserved ingredients. Were they valuable? I can pay you... Snape's face contorted in a spasm that froze her insides. I do not require your father's filthy money. The words stole her breath with their potency. For a moment neither of them moved. Rigel didn't dare to even breathe. In his gaze there was a hate so old it had petrified. She wondered how heavy a memory must be to sink emotions so deep, and how long it must be left in the dark to grow such fangs. He blinked or she did, and the air was breathable again. Some intangible darkness returned to the edges of the room, the edges of consciousness where it belonged. Snape's entire frame flinched, and his eyes went as blank as a new blackboard. Forgive me, bl He glared at nothing, or perhaps himself. I... It's fine, her voice made up for his in neutrality. It's been a taxing evening. Like you said, I was only going to say, though, that I could pay you back with work if you wanted. You know, scrubbing cauldrons or... But that can wait as well. Good night, sir. Good evening. She left before either of them could say anything else. For all that he'd hidden it quickly, she knew what she saw. Snape hated Sirius. Not like the cannons hated the magpies, not like the ripping rivalry Sirius and James nursed from school. This was something altogether deeper, more sinister. Your father does not factor here. What a lie that had been. He'd lectured her about suppressing her emotions, but Snape was a man with a pain so deep she doubted he had a name for it, and looking at her brought it snarling to the surface. That was fine, she assured herself on her way back to the common room. He didn't have to like her. He had made it exceedingly clear that he would do his duty as head of house no matter what. As long as she could make him see that giving her the potions instruction she needed counted as part of that duty, he would do it. She did not need anyone's affection, not even her own. Friday morning found Rigel eating calmly at the Slytherin table, bookended by her friends. Maybe she sat facing the entrance hall doors, but it wasn't to avoiding looking at the staff table. Her friends didn't seem to notice her preoccupation, but knowing them, they'd noticed and politely declined to comment on it. Either way, she was grateful. The hatred between her head of house and her father and uncles hadn't seemed entirely real before. She'd been aware of it in snide comments when she dog-eared Snape's articles and in the way Remus carefully edited stories from their youth, but it had been nothing more than an abstract obstacle. A barrier to be overcome like any other in her determination to be taught by the greatest potions master alive. She hadn't considered what that enmity meant for Professor Snape, faced with the child of his enemy and asked to shovel the muck of the past beneath a thin academic veneer. Who was she to think decades of grievance and the kind of emotion that could fuel a fire for that many years would be swept aside with the work of a few weeks? She would try harder and be more patient, she promised herself. She wouldn't give up, but she wouldn't expect to be seen entirely in her own light all at once. 
As long as he gave her instruction, no matter how bitterly, she could live with the spectre of her uncle's adolescent memory hanging about. Her thoughts were interrupted when a speckled eagle owl swooped down and dropped a letter before sailing off, not even stopping to nip at the bacon. Draco's quick hands saved it from the oatmeal. Thanks, she said, checking the envelope. The words Rigel Black on the nondescript envelope stilled her breathing. She didn't recognize the handwriting, too thin to be from Flint. No one at home would address a letter to Archie that way. Archie knew she'd taken his middle name, but why would he change his handwriting? An eagle owl meant an emergency if it was from Archie, so she excused herself from the table without finishing her breakfast. Good thing she did, really, as she might have thrown it back up again when she read it. Black, be at Greenhouse 4 by sundown, or everyone will know your secret. Come alone. Rigel crumpled the note and shoved it into her pocket on her way to the dungeons. Her feet knew the route to the potions classroom without input from her racing mind. The vagueness of the threat concerned her. It meant whoever sent it might not know anything at all. It also meant she had to go, in case they did. The perfect trap. It could be worse. That she'd received a letter at all meant they were looking to blackmail her, or they'd have turned her in without the warning. She could handle blackmail. Flint was proof of that, and unlike the mysterious attacks she'd been suffering, at least this time she'd get to face her antagonist, unless the letter was from the attacker, in which case it was a different kind of trap. For once, she didn't mind the rudimentary nature of the first-year potions practicals, she could brew a colour-changing potion in her sleep, so she used every watt of extra brain power to consider her options. She could tell her friends and disregard the admonition to come alone. But she might lose her chance to negotiate if she scared the other party off. Even if they showed, her secret could be revealed to her friends. She could ignore it, pretend she had nothing to hide. Except what she had to hide was so dangerous she couldn't afford to underestimate the threat. A bluff always worked when you had too much to lose to risk calling it incorrectly. Rigel worried the problem to the bone, then held it in her teeth resolutely. In the end, all she really needed to decide was how to slip away. She faked a stomachache. Is this about whatever Professor Snape called you in for last night? Draco asked. Rigel rolled over, her back to the door. No, she mumbled unconvincingly. You can tell me, you know, Draco tried. He's my godfather. Maybe I can talk to him. I'm fine, just go. Draco left for dinner. Rigel waited until the common room was empty to slip on her cloak and duck out. She met no one in the dungeons and darted past the cheery warmth of the great hall to the castle doors. The setting sun angled over the grounds, trailing shadows as it dipped teasingly toward the ravenous treetops. By the time she reached the greenhouses, the forest had taken its first bite. Two figures melted out of the glass wall, shucking invisibility charms at her approach. What do you know? He really came. You were right. He did have something to hide. Rigel blew out the breath she'd been holding. Rosier and Rookwood were the last people she'd expected. They'd been practically genial when Pansy introduced them. Just went to show appearances couldn't be trusted. Really? You too? Rigel shook her head in disgust. But it was mostly aimed at herself. She'd considered it might be a trap, but she hadn't thought showing up was the trap. Welcome, Secret Keeper. Rosier smiled like a saber-toothed tiger. His eyes glowed amber in the fading light, and he leaned in as though they were in danger of being overheard. Tell us, what confidences do you so willingly endanger yourself to keep? Rigel took a step back, unnerved, but Rookwood was there on her other side. More intimidating than Rosier's amused smirk was Rookwood's silent stare. She lifted her chin and said nothing. No? Shame? Rosier let out a bored sigh. Still, we did not come here to learn your secrets, petty as they undoubtedly are. What do you want, then? 
We don't trust you. Rookwood's ocean-deep voice held not a drop of remorse. Rosier nodded. That's the sum of it. Pansy vouched for you, bent over backwards to get us in the room with you, but at that meeting it became clear her judgment has been compromised where you are concerned. And she is not here with you. And she is not here, Rosier repeated ominously, which means you are keeping secrets from her too. Which means you can't be trusted. Rigel shot Rookwood a scowl. She couldn't be trusted. They were the ones sending cryptic, threatening notes to eleven-year-olds. And those who cannot be trusted, Rosier drew out the suspense with a smile, must be tested. Tested? Rosier exchanged an amused look with Rookwood, and she had to think this was all just a game to them. They had never known or cared about her secrets. If we're to approve your friendship with Pansy, you must be worthy. You've shown you aren't trustworthy, I'm afraid. But we have hopes that your friendship holds worth of another kind. Rigel wished he would get to the point. It was brave to come out here alone to face an unknown enemy, Rookwood said. Brave or rather craven? Were you terribly afraid we'd spill your secrets? Shall we find out which it is? Rosier laughed. Don't look so scared. We just want to see if you're worthy of your house. Run a little errand for us and you'll be on your way. What kind of an errand? The kind that tests your resourcefulness, of course. You can't be a Slytherin without Slytherin's qualities. Rosier's smile turned sharp and she felt the other shoe drop. If you don't want to, all you have to do is agree to break off your friendship with Pansy. If you aren't around her, we don't care how unworthy you are. No! Rigel said louder than she'd intended. She glared at the two older students. Pansy's my friend, and if you know her half as well as you think, you'd know that she won't appreciate this kind of manoeuvring behind her back. True, Rookwood said. But what Pansy doesn't know won't get us into trouble with her, Rosier added quickly. You won't be telling her. It wasn't a question. What's your errand, then? Are you sure Pansy's worth all this trouble? She is. Rigel scowled at Rosier for suggesting otherwise. Maybe she was a rotten liar, but she wasn't a bad friend. A potter didn't abandon her friends lightly, and if she'd learned one thing about Slytherins, it was they stuck together no matter what. She wouldn't be shaming either of her houses that night. Wonderful! Rosier smiled as though he were a sphinx, and she'd solved his riddle. Then here is your task. Acquire two springs of fresh Canterbury and bring them back here. You have two hours, Rookwood added. Rigel stared at them. Canterbury's grew on shade-loving vines, in trees. She looked to the forbidden forest as her blood started pumping faster. Be glad it's not a full moon tonight. Rosier inspected his nails with affected unconcern. Rigel made a face, but she had already agreed to the task, and the sooner she got it done, the better. She could only hope the truly dangerous creatures of the forest did not stir until deeper in the night. She gave Hagrid's cabin a wide berth, in case his dog had sensitive ears. The only thing worse than traipsing through the Forbidden Forest at night would have to be getting caught traipsing through the Forbidden Forest at night. The forest, so hauntingly silent during the day, teemed with life now. The autumn breeze set the leaves to whistling, insects chirped and trilled in unseen numbers, and every twig beneath her feet was a snare in a concerto for strings, jarringly out of place. Canterbury's grew in bunches like grapes, and the vines liked to wrap themselves around the widest trees they could find. The trees on the edge of the forest weren't nearly wide enough. Trees got bigger as they got older, but also as they got closer to water. The older trees would be in the very centre of the forest, where it had first begun, but that would also be the most dangerous section. She found a swathe of trees growing bigger in parallel to the tree line and went that way, hoping some offshoot of the Black Lake was responsible. Ten minutes later, she came upon a healthy stream. 
The presiding trees swelled with pride of place nearest the water and, sure enough, wore the distinctive twisting vines of Canterbury for their ornaments of state. The vines trailed conspicuously from the sturdy branches to skim the surface of the water, and Rigel eyed the sprigs of berries, all out of reach. Animals would have eaten any that hung low enough, she supposed. She could try to knock some down, but the vines were thick. She might drop a few berries, but likely not a whole spray. She would have to climb up and then out over the water to get the berries. Her left wrist gave a reluctant twinge, but she cradled it against her stomach reassuringly. First a rope. Rigel pulled a few of the looser, dying vines off a nearby tree and braided them together, using her teeth when necessary. She divested herself of the cumbersome cloak and robes, and after a few tries managed to loop the braided vine over the strongest-looking branch of the largest tree. She tied one end in a slipknot and tightened it until she had a long strand fastened securely to a branch high above. The other end went around her waist, just in case. She hooked her right arm over the lowest branch and walked up the trunk with her legs. Her shoulder protested the one-handed hang, but it was only until she could get a leg over the top. Rigel wriggled like a drunk monkey, but managed to right herself to a seat on the first branch. While she rested, she shortened the rope around her waist. Now she couldn't fall further than the first branch. From the first branch, she could reach the second and third by simply standing and hefting one leg over. When she reached a branch that went all the way out over the water, she hugged it against her belly and scooted, feeling like an overgrown inchworm. The Canterbury vines were strong, but Rigel managed to gracelessly peel a few sprigs in curling protest from where they connected. She tossed them to the river bank, then began the careful climb down after them. Her limbs were still shaking from the climb up, but she made it to the lowest branch without falling. From there, she risked a jump, intentionally rolling onto her right side as she landed. A groan boiled up as her left wrist jarred, but her ankles survived unsprained. She brushed herself off the best she could and collected the sprigs of berries from the ground. They were a little bruised, but recognisable and undeniably fresh, the green flesh of the broken connection raw and exposed. She had just wrapped them in her cloak when the sound of slow applause rose over the bubbling stream. Pleased with himself, isn't he? Well earned. Rosier and Rookwood dropped their disillusionment simultaneously. You followed me. She wasn't sure if she should be grateful or annoyed, but she did think better of them, knowing they hadn't actually sent a first year into the forest alone. Rookwood eyed her cloak-wrapped berries. You made quick work of our task. How did you know the berries would be here? Been wandering the forest often, Rosier suggested. They grow on big trees. Big trees grow near water. Rigel narrowed her eyes. Were you hoping I'd wander around in the dark for two hours? Scared out of my mind? Rosier looked a little guilty. Our time limit certainly didn't give you enough credit. Rigel unrolled her cloak, letting the berries fall to their feet. Since you're here, I don't have to take these back to the greenhouse, right? Unless you need them for a bunion cream. Rosier laughed. No, the berries don't matter. We just wanted to see what you would do. You are resourceful and brave, and you didn't renounce Pansy. In short, you pass. Rosier smiled at her, but Rigel was not feeling very celebratory. Her wrist ached, and she was covered in dirt. She went to pull on her robes, but Rookwood stopped her. You're injured! Rosier made a noise of understanding. That's why you climbed the tree one-handed. Rigel shifted her wrist behind her back defensively. Of course they would notice the bandage peeking out from her sleeve. Is it broken? Rookwood pressed. Rigel searched his stoic face, trying to decide whether she could get away with a lie, but taking her eyes off Rosier was a mistake. He grabbed her elbow and pried her left arm out where he could examine it. It's the wrist. He peeled back her sleeve. 
Well wrapped, but our certified Mediwitch can fix this in a heartbeat. Why in Salazar's name are you walking around injured, Rigel Black? That's none of your business, Rigel said, reclaiming her arm and stepping out of Rosier's reach. Rosier gave Rookwood a conspiratorial smirk. So we did find a secret. He's trustworthy after all, the taller boy agreed. She didn't pretend to understand them. Now having secrets makes me trustworthy. Try to think like a Slytherin, the golden-eyed boy, tutted. Us knowing one of your secrets makes you easier to trust because a person can always be trusted to protect their secrets. Rookwood cracked a smile at her confused face. Everyone has secrets, he acknowledged. But a person whose secrets we know is less concerning than a person who appears to have none. Whatever you say, she said tiredly. If our business is concluded, I'd like to get back before my friends miss me. Our business is far from completed, Rosier said with a dangerous smile, but we'll walk you back to the castle. Wouldn't do to let Pansy's new friend get lost in the woods. Rigel started walking, but Rosier suddenly snapped his fingers. Oh, I almost forgot. Edmund, would you mind? Rookwood drew his wand and Rigel backed into a tree, all too aware that she had no means to defend herself. The quieter Slytherin held up his other hand peaceably. I'm going to fix your wrist. She stared at him. Fix her? Could he? Rookwood approached slowly and drew her arm from her side with a broad hand on her bicep. She couldn't help her flinch when he slid his hand down to her wrist, but it was only to move the once white shirt sleeve out of the way. Rookwood held her gaze reassuringly as he began to unwrap the bandages. Rigel let him. Was this how a wild animal felt when a human tried to help it? She had no inclination to trust them after they'd baited her into coming out there and wasted her evening proving some obscure point about friendship and Slytherin qualities. On the other hand, if they really could fix her wrist, the twins had said it would need until Halloween to heal on its own. When the injury was uncovered, the older boys studied it critically. I expected worse, Rosier admitted. The bone has already been set, Rookwood noted. His fingers were careful as he probed the break. When was this broken? Rigel glanced between them. Rosier's smile did not reassure her, but Rookwood's unflappable calm did. So she said, first Saturday of term. How? Rosier could not suppress his curiosity for even a moment. Fell down some stairs, it caught in the strap of my bag and twisted. Rosier winced sympathetically. I supposed you passed out? I think so. The golden-eyed boy nodded. Otherwise, your scream would have brought someone running. You kept this to yourself. I have to wonder why. Rookwood prompted her when she didn't answer. Someone... Set it for you. Yes, but they didn't know how to fix it. Why not just go to the hospital wing? Rosier shook his head. I don't trust healers. Oh. Rosier's eyes went wide. Because of what happened to your... Alden... Rosier clamped his mouth shut and shot Rookwood a grateful look. Sorry, he muttered, uncalled for. She accepted his apology with a nod. The less said about her reasons, the better. But if they wanted to assume it was because of Archie's mum, that was fine with her. Rookwood pointed his wand at her broken wrist and she tensed. Not to worry, Rosier said bracingly. Edmund's family runs a shelter for magical creatures. He fixes animals all the time, and first years are basically the same. Don't listen to Alden. Rookwood's voice was rough but soothing, like sand being raked in a zen garden. Take a deep breath and hold still. Rookwood cast a numbing spell that made her ears roar. She missed the incantation he spoke next, but a hot then cold sensation rushed out through her fingers and up her elbow from the break, and the next moment she was staring at a perfectly mended wrist. You'll have to be careful for a bit. Build up the strength again. Rookwood let a wry smile tug one side of his mouth. I don't recommend climbing any trees. 
Rigel moved her hand back and forth, wonderingly. It's fixed. I... Thank you. Thank you very much. A smile took charge of her face, irrepressibly. She wanted to laugh. She wanted to swing a bat. The endorphins might make you a little giddy, Rookwood added. She didn't care. She felt wonderful. On the way back to the castle, she thanked them several more times. Stop it! Rosier finally protested. It's embarrassing. We wouldn't just let you walk back into the common room injured. Someone might think we'd done it. Anyway, secrets aren't that interesting once you know them. Rigel grinned at him. It was good to know that gratitude got under his skin. Rosier narrowed his uncanny eyes at her pleased expression. Don't look so cheerful. You aren't out of the woods yet. Rigel looked around the open grounds with exaggerated irony. That's not what I meant. Stop laughing, Ed, Rosier scowled. Fine, then. Enjoy your moment of victory, but this isn't over. Now that we've eliminated this one, we'll have to discover one of your other secrets before you're trustworthy again. Whatever you say, Rosier, as long as it doesn't involve a nature walk through the Forbidden Forest. I'm sure I can think up something worse, Rosier muttered. The effects of the healing magic faded before they reached the common room. Her reservations about the older boys came back, tempered only by the knowledge that they hadn't actually hurt her. Her father would think it a harmless bit of hazing, but she remembered all too well the look in Snape's eyes the night before. It was a fine line. Pansy's face lit up when Rigel came in, flanked by Rosier and Rookwood, and even with her reservations in mind, the whole thing felt immediately worth it. What a sap she'd become! Still, if she expected Snape to turn the other cheek when it came to her family, she could do no less. Flexing her pain-free wrist unconsciously, she wished both boys a pleasant evening and made for her dorm. A long shower was just the thing. Any lingering bad feelings would go the way of the dirt on her skin down the drain. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.